It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And uh, I've actually got, oh, first, good morning, everybody. Uh, How's everybody doing out there? And for those of you listening to this at other times of the day, well, whatever it is, whatever time of the day, happy day to you too as well. Good morning, good day, good evening, good day. Yes, that's right. And good night. And we're done. Uh, That's all the time we have, folks. (laughs) Time for some coffee. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I I see we kind of coordinated on our clothing today, so kind of. Well, well, yeah, there's some blue in here, and you've got some blue. blue. They're floral. They're floral. Oh, look, and I forgot to take my glasses off, too. Okay, these are my cheaters, which I probably should keep (laughs) on because now I'm suddenly really blurry in there, but uh, oh, Lordy. Oh, well, it's Sunday morning. And I've got, I I have Legata Cam set up. We're not going to go to it now. I might go to it later Mm -hmm. uh, when we have more time in the show because we want to get right to uh, our guests. uh, But before we let you know that... uh, uh, we've got uh, some great stuff on the show today. We're actually going to have, believe it or not, a Natural Awakenings Chicago report. Um, we are. And I don't. And I yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're not ready for this. <laughs> and, and and what if I throw um, uh, what I learned this week? There you go. We give a. I may throw at you what I learned this week as well. So you might want to want to think Uh-oh. about that too. Yeah. 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 Um, but, uh, we will do that today. And I don't know why we haven't done that, uh, in the past, but, uh, suddenly it just occurred to me like, come on, Peggy's the publisher of this magazine. We've got to do, uh, talk about what's, what's in the latest issues. So, uh, you get to do that, uh, starting this week. Um, and of course, meteorologist Rick DeMaio and, um, later in the show, we're also going to be talking about a number of issues. Um, one of the things I didn't even mention to you, Peggy, um, that I wanted to chat about very briefly is the report from the Delta Institute that came out this past week uh, about uh, recycling in Chicago. Mm-hmm. We're not, I'm not going to go into it in depth, but it had uh, some very interesting conclusions um, and strategies for improving the recycling rate in the city of Chicago, some of which people like me and the Chicago Recycling Coalition and a bunch of others have been saying for years, surprise, uh, but it's good to have somebody officially say it in a report that has been, you know, that they can hand over to mm-hmm. the city and say, hey, please get this done uh, or at least try this. Wouldn't that be a good idea? We're going to talk about that and some, uh, I forget what else, we, we had a list of oh, things. Some events coming up. Right. Uh, so, all right. Some events to talk about. Yeah. Um, so, uh, let us uh, immediately go to our guests this morning because um, they're on kind of a time crunch, and I want to make sure that uh, we give them all the time necessary um, to talk about an issue that we alluded to last week. A couple of weeks ago, an article came out by a guy named Dan Egan, who we have had on this program. He's an author and a writer, and it was in the New York Times, and it was an article about the city of Chicago. And it's, as I said in my blog post, uneasy relationship to water. Um, And uh, people who uh, are on the coasts might think, well, that's really, the water problems are there. 
Uh, you know, there are water problems uh, on the oceans and there are water problems inland where there is no water. And people might think, well, you know, Chicago's got the best of both worlds, but not really. Um, and to talk about this and other matters is Deborah Shore, Commissioner for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Uh, if you're watching us on the stream, you can see her in the lower left corner. Uh, good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Mike and Peggy. Delighted to be with you this morning. It's always Good such morning. a pleasure to have you on the show, and um, we're so honored that you do this for us. Uh, you've you've always been a good friend to the program, and um, and when I announced that you were going to be on the show, I had a number of people write, "Oh, that's so good because she's so smart and she knows her stuff." Um, and you've been on the board of the MWRD since 2006. And, and I don't think that was the exact point uh, that the change began, but there's, there's something to be said for around that time, getting people who weren't just politicians, but people who, who actually cared uh, about water issues uh, to serve on the MWRD, which is probably the most important agency that many people don't know about um, with a $1.2 billion budget. Uh, you're nodding because you write about that, don't you, Deborah? I do, Mike. I send out occasional electronic newsletters and produce an annual report. They're up on my website, which is deborahshore.org. Uh, and it's been a propitious time. I joined the board, as you noted, in late 2006. The Water Reclamation District got authority for stormwater management in Cook County only at the end of 2004. So it really began a new way of entering people's lives, often unfortunately through basement backups or flooding uh, these intense rainstorms, which is the way climate change is expressing itself in our region. Yes, uh, and uh, and I had didn't realize that uh, that it had been so recently that uh, the agency was entrusted with that responsibility. So thank you oh, for oh, oh. for that. Uh, and who was responsible for stormwater before that? If I can ask really quickly. Sure, it was the purview of Cook County government, uh, mm -hmm. which but the district kept getting complaints about flooding, had to deal with it, and over a period of years persuaded the county to relinquish that authority and it took an act of the state legislature to transfer that authority with a, a very modest amount of additional taxing authority to the water reclamation district. So now it manages two of the three legs of our freshwater ecosystem, namely used water and rainwater. Yeah, and I see a, a parallel there to something I just mentioned, uh, which was this recycling uh, in Chicago. Uh, that is turning that responsibility over to an agency that uh, is uh, entrusted with that and, and it, whose sole purpose is to deal with that. In Chicago, wouldn't it be great if recycling and environmental matters could be turned back over to the Department of the Environment, which used to exist, rather than spreading it out among all of the other agencies and departments in the city where often it gets buried and um, they don't know what to do with it. So uh, um, thank you for that information. Now on our lower right there is uh, your colleague, Justin Hart. Uh, who's a science and policy advisor for Commissioner Shore. He's a, um, a, he has a master's degree from the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. You've worked with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and uh, Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene on Great Lakes uh, water topics. Uh, welcome to the show, Justin. Good morning, Mike and Peggy. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's it's such a pleasure to have you both because uh, we we want the um, we want the commissioner here, but we also want the science guy here as, as well. You always you always want the the science guy behind the uh, by behind the scenes. Uh, so let's get. And by the way, I should I I'm remiss if I don't mention that uh, Deb Shore. When I mentioned that you had a, a background in water policy before this, you were. Um, 
a founding editor of Chicago Wilderness, Mag- Wilderness Magazine, um, and uh, you worked in Habitat, uh, helped found Friends of the Forest Preserves, um, and on and on. So that's and you're a kayaker, right? That's correct. So uh, you're out there in nature doing it, and, and that those are the people you want. Um, so let's get to this story uh, that came out uh, that Dan Egan wrote, and um, uh, you and I went back and forth a little bit about this, Deborah, about how um, it's you kind of called it. I, I don't think these are the exact words, but you said it was hopeful. Uh, I thought it was uh, fascinating and informative for people who don't understand why Chicago has any water issues at all. Um, and uh, one, at least one of my listeners thought it was a slam. So there were it hit a nerve uh, uh, for the people of Chicago. Why do you think that was, Deborah? Well, first of all, I want to commend Dan Egan for a thoroughly researched, well-written, and comprehensive article. The graphics are stunning. It's deeply informative, and I hope everyone takes the time to read it because you'll learn things. And and let me mention at this point that it is on my blog post. I put the link there so folks can I'm go to Mike putting Novak. putting it up right now in the feed, too. Okay, great. And by the way, those of you watching on uh, the YouTube feed, starting today, <laughs> because of something I learned this week, the comment section will stay up there, so uh, Peggy's notes should stay up there, too, with the links. So continue, Deborah. Yeah, the only... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. What was that, Peggy? I was going to say, this is a New York Times article. Um, it might be behind the paywall for some people. Right. Okay. Um, but I, I recommend it highly. It's a wonderful history of Chicago's uh, growth because it's completely related to its location and to water. I think what was not stated as, as explicitly is that it's also a story of human enterprise, of innovation, of adaptation, of people living in a low-lying, swampy area on the banks of a sluggish prairie river, the Chicago River, that flowed into Lake Michigan and does still, and how, as the metropolis grew, because of its location and because it could be a connection between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River system, it became a national hub for transport of goods. And yet it, most cities next to water have some degree of slope so the water can flow downhill and their wastes flow away from them when they dump them into waterways. Chicago's challenge was that people damp dumped all manner of human and animal and industrial waste into the Chicago River, which is now an idea to put sewage and other contaminants into your drinking water, and people were getting sick. So part of the human enterprise was coming up with a plan to dig a canal from the south branch of the Chicago River to the Des Plaines River to build a lock and use water from the lake to reverse the river and flow, push our waste downstream away from the city. <laughs> and it worked. It allowed Chicago to become a great metropolis. And yet it also caused some other problems. It connected the Mississippi watershed with the uh, Great Lakes, allowing invasive species to move in both directions along this man-made highway. No one thought people would want to canoe or kayak or fish or even swim in what in 1900 was dug as a, a, a route for barge traffic and a conveyance for human sewage. And yet, over the years, people have. We now treat our sewage we don't put raw sewage as much as possible into the waterways, except for occasional storm overflows. And now it's a much healthier waterway. But that was a 20th century solution, even a 19th century solution to a public health problem. 
we now need to come up with 21st century solutions to the challenges we face. Yeah, uh, something that you uh, sent me, Justin, um, that you talked about, Deborah, the other day was a guy named Steve Johnson uh, who um, wrote a book, How We Got to Now, Six Innovations That Made the Modern World. I've got a link to that also at uh, my website. And he writes, we rarely think about it, but the growth and vitality of cities have always been dependent on our ability to manage the flow of human waste that emerges when people crowd together. From the very beginnings of human settlements, figuring out where to put all the excrement has been just as important as figuring out how to build shelter or town squares or marketplaces. And this is the kind of thing that people really don't want to talk about. They don't, they don't want to mention this. Um, And as we get to, Uh, 9 billion people in the middle of this century, we're going to need to talk about this more and more. Um, And it's something, Deborah, that you and I have uh, talked about before in terms of biosolids, uh, Mm -hmm. which, and that's a, that's a a cute term for, for, um, uh, for human waste. And uh, how do you treat biosolids so that they can become fertilizer or have other uses uh, and I and I have known in my years doing this uh, a lot of people who said no we can't do that that's they're, they're they're toxic and they and I say well what what do you what's your solution then if you don't treat those uh, and this is this is something that you also deal with at the MWRD right that's correct so sewage is both liquid and solid waste it's conveyed through pipes to seven wastewater or sewage treatment plants that uh, the district operates throughout Cook County. The solid wastes are separated from the liquid wastes and treated and the, the higher quality liquid waste is discharged into the Chicago waterways and the solid waste. We now are mixing much of it with wood chips from the city and producing a high quality compost it can be used, it's available free of charge at our treatment plants for individuals to uh, look on. There's a lot of nutrients in it. And due to a what we call a pre-treatment program, where the district's pollution control officers go out to various industries and factories mm-hmm. and work with them so that heavy metals and other constituents that used to contaminate uh, the industrial waste coming into our treatment plants no longer does so. Instead, it's kept and treated at the factory or, or industrial site so that the proportions of heavy metals and other things in the solids is far lower than the standard, and uh, we surpass uh, in terms of a low, low level those on our website. Uh, what's in the be a wonderful uh, source of nutrients, a soil amendment used on golf courses, athletic fields, park districts, and uh, uh, available to consumers. Yeah, and uh, um, Mil- Milorganite has been doing this yeah. for decades. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and uh, they 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 have set the uh, the gold standard for this, uh, and they de- de- dealt with issues like heavy metals. In fact, they shut down their factories in the mid '90s uh, for a time just so they could fix that problem. Um, a lot of people, I get what I call the malorganite question all the time, which is, you know, is it safe? And my answer is, yeah, you should use it. Um, and uh, it's, but it's up to you. you. You know, there are a lot of different kinds of fertilizer out there. Uh, and again, if we don't figure out a use for our bio salads, we're going to be swimming in them. So uh, what I want to get to here um, is uh, have you, Justin, maybe walk us through some uh, graphics that uh, you uh, sent to me the other day so we can give folks an idea of what's going on with the water flow in Chicago. You can read that article by Dan Egan. That's a good way to do it. But you also have, yes, Peggy. 
I was going to say, just to, to put a, another little context around Dan's article, it's talking about the acceleration with climate change and the effect of Chicago. Right. And that we, we will certainly uh, get yeah. to that. But all right. So uh, here is the, uh, the, the first uh, graphic that you sent me, uh, Justin. Uh, tell us what we're taking a look at here. Sure. So I also would like to say, you know, Dan Egan did a great job of describing this system in his article and would also recommend it. And this is just another way to look at what he was describing and what those images were showing, just kind of as a cross section. So you can see the Chicago River in a way that you don't get to um, often. Uh, so here you can see this is the Chicago River under normal conditions where there isn't excessive uh, runoff entering the river uh, as it would during a storm. And so as Commissioner Shaw mentioned, uh, the Chicago area is very flat and uh, we know that water flows downhill. Uh, and so uh, the water does not flow very fast because there is not a great slope. Uh, and one of the solutions to that is uh, when these canals were dug was to pump in water from Lake Michigan to kind of shove that water along so that it goes downstream. Um, so you can see that on the right hand side, you've got Lake Michigan and you've got that arrow of the sluice gates open of water entering from the lake to the Chicago area waterway system, which includes the Chicago River and kind of pushing that water along toward the left side of your screen. Um, and along the way, you get the treated effluent from the water reclamation plants and you get the uh, natural flow from uh, rivers like the, uh, the north branch of the Chicago River. Um, and that all flows downstream, as Commissioner Schroer was saying, to um, a dam and it's a powerhouse uh, that generates electricity at Lockport. Um, and one thing that I think is very notable about this image that you can kind of see, and it's not done to scale, but uh, one of the issues that Dan Egan was describing was the difference in elevation between the river and the lake. And so you can see under normal conditions on the right hand side, the lake is higher than the river. And this helps the water come in from the lake and push the river along. Um, and then on the left hand side, you can see that there is another drop between the river and where it goes over the dam. Um, and as Dan was, Egan was describing in his piece, there uh, can be conditions where there is not much headspace between the river and the lake. Uh, but on the other side, uh, there's about a 40 foot drop. So there's much more vertical capacity downstream um, toward the dam side. And so with the water flowing that way, uh, it's, it's a much uh, more reliable way to relieve floods. Um, by having the water flow down toward Lockport. Uh, yeah, and and so this looks perfectly normal. It is, is a little scary to see uh, all of that water uh, on Lake Michigan higher than, but that's the way it was engineered. That's what they mm -hmm. did 100 years ago in Chicago to make sure that uh, gravity took effect and took that water. And yes, Peggy. Uh, I was going to, uh, just asking for our listeners, those sluice those sluice gates or the locks, where exactly are those located? Sure, that's a great question. Um, they're at three locations. Uh, one is at Wilmette, uh, kind of by the Baha'i Temple. Um, right behind there is uh, a, a controlling works. It's not a lock as you'd find in the other two spots, which are um, right downtown, uh, uh, where the Chicago River, uh, kind of by the river walk where the river walk meets the the lake uh those are locks there and that's where the uh lake is also entering uh the river and then the third location is down by the port of chicago on the calumet river um and at those three locations lake michigan is uh, uh water is uh, enters the system and pushes the the river water along downstream toward the des plains river Okay, so we move on then. So that is normal conditions here. And then we have moderate conditions. Uh, what has changed, Justin? Sure. So you're seeing that the there, there's a new source of water that's entering the Chicago area waterway system, and that's combined sewer overflow. And so when it rains, uh, sometimes there is more rain entering the sewer system than the sewer system can handle um, or that the treatment plants can treat at one time. And when that happens, uh, the, the pipes fill up. And once they are full, uh, the, the way of relieving that pressure, instead of having that go into people's basements, and it, it, it exits through these outfalls, these uh, combined sewer, sewer overflow outfalls into the river. And so the extra excess water is pumped into the river rather than into people's homes and basements. Um, uh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, and you can see on the right that the river, Chicago River, is slightly higher than the level of Lake Michigan, but it's being held behind the sluice gates because they're closed at this point. Correct. Um, and you're also seeing uh, the water that's coming in from the tributaries and the water reclamation plants is also larger than it, was, it would be under normal conditions. Um, and the way that the elevation in the Chicago uh, River is maintained is through that dam. And so you're seeing that there's kind of this tilt because uh, more water is being rushed through that dam to try to lower the system and relieve that flood pressure from the upstream. All right. And now the uh, the dire level is pre uh, is pictured in this graphic. Um, this is probably what we had going last year. Uh, is that right, Justin? Uh, yes, this would have been similar to the conditions that uh, Danny Egan was describing in his article for May of last year. Um, one difference would be, you know, this is this uh, graphic is kind of describing average level or average uh, extreme storm conditions. Uh, and, but that, so to say that Lake Michigan here is lower than it would have been in the article that he is describing. And so those lines would be much closer to each other. Um, and so what's going on here compared to the last one, you saw that the, the water, uh, was, uh, close to the height of the barricade between Lake Michigan and the river, but it didn't exceed it. Um, here there's just so much water that's entering. It's a major storm. Um, that the river is rising faster than it can be dumped out through the dam. And uh, instead, again, we're trying to, the, the, the engineering is trying to prevent uh, water from entering people's homes and basements and flooding downtown. Uh, the other way to relieve that pressure in the system is uh, unfortunately to dump the water into Lake Michigan. And uh, again, water flows downhill. So there needs to be a difference in elevation between the height of the river and the height of the lake. And the river needs to be higher than the lake for that to happen. Wow. And that's kind of what we were dealing with uh, last year uh, when we had uh, the wettest May ever, which followed the wettest May the year before, which followed the wettest May the year before. And then, of course, this year we had very little rain in May. In fact, we are still in drought conditions, as we will be talking about with meteorologist uh, Rick DeMaio in certain parts uh, of the area, including the northern part of Illinois, southern part of of. Wisconsin, uh, which takes us to the question that Peggy raised, which is um, climate change and how much that is affecting what mm -hmm. is happening here. Uh, Deborah, do you want to uh, address that? Uh, sure, I'll try to. I want to just add one uh, fact to Justin's uh, description of how the system works, and that is that the height differential between where the sanitary and ship canal begins at the south branch of the Chicago River and then 26 miles of canal to join the Des Plaines River at Lockport where there is that hydroelectric dam. It's only six feet of difference. That's not a lot of slope. So you can understand that it takes quite some time for water to move from the main stem in downtown Chicago, 26 miles to Lockport. Um, I have called that the audacity of slope, the idea of the slope because they wanted it to serve for commercial barge traffic and navigation and so forth. But that poses a problem too, when you try to release more water at Lockport to give the whole system more capacity to hold water yeah. in a rainstorm. Yeah, we now, do have one question here, Deb. Someone was asking, sure. um, what's the downstream impact if the dam at Lockport has overflow? Well, the dam doesn't overflow. They can control the release through various gates uh, at Lockport. Um, but we have seen in years past, you know, very high water levels in the Mississippi do not mm -hmm. to release at the Lockport Dam, but uh, heavy rainfall throughout yeah. the upper Mississippi watershed where barges, barge traffic was closed for weeks at a time 
by the Army Corps because of dangerously high water levels and flows in the entire Mississippi watershed. Uh, but it, we have not seen increased flooding when there are high flows uh, at Lockport okay. into the dust plains. All right. Now this takes us, uh, and, and we're doing, <laughs> this is a crash course in, yeah. in, in what the MWRD deals with. And by the way, folks who think uh, we're going to break at 930. We're not. We're going a little bit further so I can let Deborah Shore go and uh, Justin, uh, let them get out of here and get on with their Sunday. Um, but um, the uh, one of the ways that you've mitigated this is with the TARP project, which a lot of people call Deep Tunnel. Uh, and my standard joke, and I have to say it every show, is that Deep Tunnel empties into my basement. Um, and um, <laughs> and I apologize. Not once, but twice. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I and I won't even do the rim shot. And the and the reason I say this is because this is was my basement several weeks ago, um, and that was water that this was. Five days after I after I had wa standing water in the basement, had the basement rotted, um, and then uh, we got four inches of rain. Um, I think four and a half in my yard. It was in that neighborhood in 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 afternoon, um, and uh, there was a a a a tornado warning in Chicago. Sirens going off and that sort of thing. And they said, "Go to your basement." Kathleen and I go out in the basement. I grab Legata the cat. We go to the basement, and then the water starts bubbling up. And I said, "We're going back upstairs, folks. I don't care. Um, uh, you know, we'll we'll take our chances uh, uh, on the first floor." Now, there's not a lot of that loop, loop, loop. yeah, yep. exactly. There's not a lot of standing water, as you can see there. Uh, but it's always disconcerting to see sewage coming up uh, into your basement, into your home. Uh, and then you you have to to deal with that uh, when it's done. So uh, ex I want to show this an amazing video and thank you, um, Justin, for sending this to me. This is the McCook Reservoir, and I've been there because I was there uh, with you, Deborah, when it opened in, at the end of 2017. I remember that that just chilly December day because um, I, I had a nasty cold and I didn't want to go, but I really wanted to see it. Um, and would you explain, uh, I'll leave our mics on as we're watching this, uh, either one of you can explain uh, exactly what we're seeing here. So the McC this is phase one of the McCook Reservoir, which was dug, uh, it's off of I-55, and it was dug from ground level 300 feet down. It can hold, I believe it's three and a half billion gallons of mm. stormwater overflow. And that's wow. three and a half billion gallons that goes into this huge reservoir instead of going into people's basements or causing flooding. And in the space of about 20 hours, uh, during a, a major storm. This is where the main stem of the tunnel uh, empties into this reservoir to give it more capacity. And it, phase two of the McCook Reservoir will hold six and a half billion gallons of stormwater. Wow. It is being dug now and will go online in 2029. And that will really help uh, relieve flooding and and I'm playing this um, again because uh, it uh, watching it fill up just I don't know about you it's kind of terrifying uh, and I know it's a time lapse but that's it would would you say three billion gallons uh, three and a half billion I believe yeah and when you see In go less up there than twenty hours um, and and when it gets to the top like that. I, I imagine there's a sluice that's closed at that point, so it can't overflow. Because I, I look at that and I think of my basement. <laughs> it's like, how far can this go? Um, and uh, it's just remarkable uh, the way this fills up. But this, even as you say, there's going to be more capacity. But even when that's done, is that going to be able to handle climate change uh, events that happen in our area? No, because, and I'm sorry to say that, and I, I want to make, 
two points. One is when we think about tornadoes and hurricanes, we know we can try to prepare for them and take mm -hmm. some measures to buttress our homes and protect ourselves, but we can't prevent them. And some of these intense rainstorms that we have experienced and that we will experience are akin to a tornado or a hurricane in terms of a natural event, a natural disaster. We can prepare for them, but we can't prevent them. And unfortunately, because we invest in our sewer infrastructure and our stormwater infrastructure, we think, well, I paid for that, it ought to handle it. But the truth is our sewer systems below the streets of our villages and cities is designed to handle what's called a five-year storm, not a hundred-year storm. And so the capacity of the local pipes to handle these intense dumps of rain, as you mentioned, four inches in a, a short period of time, that overwhelms the capacity of our local sewers to even convey that water to the larger reservoirs, to the deep tunnel drop shafts. So it's a structural issue. And the challenge is how do we find ways to slow the flow into our sewers to give them the capacity yeah. that they, they need to do the job? How do we capture rain where it falls and even keep it out of the sewers by using rain gardens and rain barrels and large cisterns and green roofs and vegetated ditches along roadsides, mm -hmm. all kinds of ways mm -hmm. to called green infrastructure to capture rain, either keep it out of the sewers and allow it to recharge our underground water supply or to slow the flow so that the sewers can do what they were designed to do. And this is what you're looking at. You knew you have a new five-year uh, plan out to following the previous five-year plan. Um, and Justin, this is another thing you sent. I mean, this is kind of a simple graphic that shows uh, the runoff and in infiltration in the first panel on the left. And then in the middle, you can see that if there's too much runoff, you get uh, uh, urban flooding because of the limited pipe capacity. And then you're looking at... Uh, uh, a, an additional place to store water which can mitigate urban flooding. Uh, is there anything else you would add to that, Justin? Sure. I, I would just say that this is a scheme that has been uh, kind of come up with by uh, some very bright and capable engineers who work at the MWRD. And this is kind of a new approach that they're taking uh, to kind of uh, bring more people into the conversation because some of the terms that are used to describe storms and flood conditions. Um, you just heard Commissioner Shore talk about, you know, a five-year storm, a hundred-year storm, that can be difficult to grasp. Um, and so this is a new way of bringing that down to a, a metric that's more under, that is easier for people to understand. You know, it's easier to talk about, you know, how many gallons of water do I need to capture so that my house doesn't flood? Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, that um, takes us to the storms we had in Europe uh, the past few days, uh, in a few days ago, and some people are calling those 500 year or even a thousand year storms. A thousand year storms, a yeah. And it's, an, and a lot of folks say that some folks said we didn't get warning. Other folks said we got the warning. There was just nothing we could do about it. There was no way to move that fast. Yeah. Um, and that's the, uh, an extension of what I experienced with four inches of rain. So what are you telling you? What you're telling us, Deborah, is that there was just so much rain that came down at once that even with the mitigation factors you had in place, they couldn't handle it. That's right. And I think there are two other factors. One is we didn't used to uh, finish our basements. And it was much more common decades ago for people to realize that basements might take on a little bit of water and they had cement floors and drains and it wasn't as disruptive or damaging to our lives and property. Our basements may need to take on water again. But the other thing is we've been paving over our landscape as we build out our homes and pave patios and build more and more big box stores and parking lots. Uh, we've given water nowhere to go. 
So part of the challenge is to create a distributed network of rain capture systems, neighborhood capture in large cisterns, much larger than a rain barrel, or removing some of that concrete skin that we've laid over the landscape and putting in permeable parking lots. Uh, how many of those very large parking lots are even ever completely full? So some of that overflow parking surface could be removed and replaced with a permeable parking lot. So I, that's the kind of major study I hope to undertake, and I hope our agency will, to look for opportunities throughout Cook County to capture water, help us become more resilient, and try to mitigate the damage that these storms cause. Well, you talk about extended producer responsibility. I think it's got. We've got to start passing laws uh, where the 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 owners of these big box stores, which are billion and billion dollar companies, are responsible for the water that uh, it lands on their property. And that, if that means permeable pavers, whatever, I don't care. Um, you know, we we the price is too high for cheap goods. Let me put it that way. The, the price we're paying is too high for yeah. cheap goods. And uh, we need some responsibility. We don't get it from the, the mega corporations, pretty much. Um, I'm going to be letting you go here in just a second. Justin, I want to give you a chance. Is there anything we've missed here that uh, you were hoping uh, to say on the program? Um, sure. I guess uh, one thing is, uh, and thank you for this opportunity, the uh, the, this article by Dan Egan is, uh, to, to tie it back to climate change, uh, he's written about not only these high lake levels, but uh, in 2013, the lake was also experiencing low lake levels. Uh, and we, and he was also describing how that could also be attributed to climate change. Uh, and so as we think about uh, the challenges that the city is facing, it's not only thinking about how flooding will occur, but also how uh, climate change can also drive the lake level down and the challenges that the city faces from that. Um, and uh, so just to, to hold both lessons in our minds as we read Danny again. Uh, that's a really good point because uh, in 2013, people were complaining about how low the lake levels were. And that, that is part of the issue, isn't it, Deborah? It is the variability and Rick DeMaio, our meteorologist talks about this all the time, climate variability. And when, and uh, unlike the ocean, as Dan Egan points out, which is going up all the time. There's, there, it's not going down at all at this point. Our lake levels are going up and down, and that creates uncertainty, doesn't it? It does. And while we have seen these fluctuations over time, uh, they're happening more ra more rapidly. The the interval is much shorter between and bigger low swings. And at least that's what we've seen in the last decade. But think of it, over the surface of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, they were six feet lower, roughly, uh, in 2013 than now. That's trillions of gallons of water difference. Mm -hmm. Where does that water go? It's vapor in the atmosphere. And, now it, and then it comes down in the form of these very intense rainstorms or elsewhere, hurricanes, yeah. and so on. It's all a system that water is a finite resource, but it's a, a renewable resource. Uh, Peggy, did you want to add something there? I was just saying, and as we get less ice in the winter and there's more evaporation, leading to more water coming back down into our sewer systems. Yep. Uh, and this is something we need to address. Well, I'm, I, I promised I would get you guys out of here, and that's what I'm doing. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Deborah Shore from the MWRD. Thank you, Justin Hart. Um, I hope to have you guys back on the show again. This has been very enlightening, and uh, I hope folks can... Uh, uh, what, what kind of action would you uh, take, Deborah, if folks say, well, what can I do? Um, do a survey of your yard or building. Are there opportunities to um, install a rain garden, a rain barrel, a larger cistern, a green roof? Uh, the district will provide technical assistance. Contact my office, happy to help. 
Uh, are there ways to, uh, if you're needing to repave your driveway, or would you consider a permeable driveway or patio? All sorts of things like that. I believe you have a permeable driveway, don't you, Deborah? Uh, it's coming. Oh, okay. All right. And I have my rain barrels, but in, in a two-inch storm, they fill up, boom, just like that. But if everybody had them, yeah. that's going to help. And, and Marta just made a note, uh, and bioswales. Right. All right. Uh, Deborah Shore, uh, Justin Hart, thank you so much. You guys have a great Sunday, and uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Bye-bye. It's the Mike, Good to talk it, to you. Sure. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We'll be right back. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. This guy is a real jerk. He treats the preserves like trash, leaving a mess wherever he goes. The garbage goes in the can, jerk. We said in the can. If kids know this behavior is idiotic, so should adults. Thanks, boys. This definitely isn't the way to get rid of your trash. Hey, jerk. That's a garbage can, not a basketball hoop to work on your terrible shot. Come on, jerk. Seriously? This isn't even the worst jerk move we see. Some jerks do much more than litter. They find spots and turn them into their personal landfill. Jerks like this are the worst kind of jerks. How'd you like it if we came to your home and did this to your front lawn, jerk? These jerks dump and run, leaving us to clean up their mess. We appreciate people who clean up after themselves and the jerks. Trash in the preserves can be harmful to wildlife and easily ruin the experience for others. So don't be a jerk. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collective Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. I see you smiling. I am so glad that you... I, you know, I was... I got a, a notice from the Forest Preserve District of Will County the mm -hmm. other day uh, about something else. And then I thought, oh my goodness, we could play all those uh, yeah. P PSAs they put together about uh, being a jerk. Don't be a jerk. All right. Don't uh, be a jerk. Don't, <laughs> and I thought... Yes, uh, we didn't because they're they're a little longer. I couldn't do it when we were on radio because uh, they were just too long to do. But now it's my show; I can do whatever I want. And so I, I, I we're going to pop up the whole series of those <laughs> mm -hmm. because they're uh, they're a stitch. And I love the fact that um, you know people tell me all the time, no, no, Mike, Mike, you've got the wrong attitude. You've you've got to treat people. Yeah, uh, you you got to you got to. You can attract more flies with honey than you can with battery acid, someone once said. All right. Um, and my feeling is, you mean I, I can't whoop them upside the head with a rolled up newspaper? And that's kind of what these, these, these things do. It's like, stop 
being a jerk. This is one of my favorites. Come on, jerk. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that it's like, okay, we're just gonna we're gonna call it what it is. These these people are jerks. And and you can always tell the jerks because that's the guy, and it's almost always a guy. Uh, the one with the baseball cap backward. That's a jerk. So there you go. Well, you can't generalize. No, but... <laughs> I, yes, I can. It's my show. I can generalize all I want. So uh, welcome but back. But yes? I think that's also the recording we just need to carry with us sometimes. Come on, jerk. Seriously? Yeah, I know. I love that. Come on. It's in grocery store Seriously? traffic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and and you Probably just want to, I'm going to hold up my phone. And I did that for a while. I had some of these drop-ins and I would just have them on my phone and I would go to situations and I would just hit. Don't button. be a jerk. Okay. And you know, just play stuff. It's like, oh boy. everybody needs their own sound effects uh, in life. Um, <laughs> well, here we are. This is our first uh, segment of, uh, uh, and we need a title for this. What's going on? in uh, Natural Awakening Chicago, um, and uh, tell us, Peggy, publisher of Natural Awakening Chicago, what the heck is going on? What oh, issue is that? Easy. This is July. Okay. August is in process. Yeah, I know. You're on scary. deadline right now, aren't you? Which is just really scary. August? How is it August? <laughs> I, I, I have How? no idea. I have no <laughs> idea. Where has the year gone? Where has the summer gone? Well, so for our listeners um, who may not be familiar, Natural Awakenings Chicago is a monthly print and digital magazine focusing on healthy lifestyles, um, both health and wellness and health of the planet, because um, it all ties together as we talk every week. Um, how healthy the planet is, how healthy the food we eat is, affects our own health and wellness and it all rolls together. So speaking of forest preserves, there's a, a piece that I'd like to talk a little bit about today. And you can read all of this at nachicago.com um, or pick up uh, the magazine at some of your favorite locations. You know, we're kind of at the middle of the month, so they're starting to run out out there, out in Cook Lake, McHenry, and portions of DuPage County. So go to nachicago.com. Okay, can, uh, can I ask a sure. question? Um, you yeah. just came, you like everybody else, you just came through a pandemic. You're a publisher. Uh, I know that last year it was weird uh, and you had to decide how many issues you had because people were not out in public. And uh, have you ramped up again? Is has it almost back to normal? Where are you? Um, it's ramped up a lot. We've kind of had to shift some of the places for distribution. A lot of downtown Chicago, for example, where many of the offices still aren't fully populated. Um, mm. We really pulled back a lot, pulling more out to the neighborhoods. Um, when all the libraries were closed, we had yeah. to cut back. Yeah. Most yeah. of the libraries are open, although a lot of the libraries took this opportunity to do remodels. <laughs> well, because the building was closed. So well, it's of course, great why not? Let's do a remodel. Yeah. 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 So some of them are still not open, but we're back in most libraries, which is a big distribution place for us. A lot of street boxes throughout the city. Train stations remained actually a pretty high distribution place. Wow. Along Interesting. the metro lines. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you were still getting the uh, the hard copies out to folks. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're actually now coming back into the season where a lot of the expos are starting again. That's right. Thank and now course. people, although... As I said earlier, this thing is not over. Let's be careful, folks. Um, yeah. If you're going to go to an expo, make sure you got your shots. Make sure you're vaccinated. Um, I still wear a mask in a lot of... In, you know what? Mostly, I realize I wear a mask to show solidarity with the workers in a store because they all have to wear masks. Um, and I think that's... And it's safer right now, um, even though I have my vaccination. So uh, yeah. that's all I'm saying. Well, let's yeah. get to your story. Sorry about that. Well, that's okay. That's okay. Well, one of the writers we have every month doing a, a section called Natural Chicago is Cheryl DeVore. And Cheryl has been on the show. Um, we've talked a few different issues with her, but she covers a lot of things that you're not going to find elsewhere. Um, some of the types of articles that used to be in Chicago Wilderness, speaking of Deborah Shore and her being a founding editor. And um, Deborah tries to bring a lot of different information of our natural world into the everyday and how it kind of affects all of us but also educates so this particular month um for july we're talking about turtles oh yay and 
lot of Cheryl's photos, Steve Bailey's photos, and a lot of other people's photos as well. Um, but speaking of the forest preserves in a lot of our local places, Peggy Notabart, we had Doug Tarrant on last week, um, Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, Brookfield Zoo, Lincoln Park Zoo, and Forest Preserve Districts in McHenry, Lake, Will, and DuPage counties, among others, have been raising and releasing state endangered Blanding's turtles into the wild. Um, and according to Cheryl, uh, they're making a little bit of a recovery. Yeah, yeah, they're making... Well, well, okay. No, no, we that's okay. No, that's good. Anyway. There we go. <laughs> that was an accidental thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, since the Forest Preserve District staff and interns began working with the Blandings turtles 12 years ago, the population in the wild has tripled. Um, at the core conservation sites where they release the hatchlings, they're finding a good mix of juveniles and adults, and they're starting to see a few of the head starts reach reproduction maturity and start building the wild populations on their own. Um, in May, the Lake County Forest Preserve District enabled a 10-year agreement with McHenry County Conservation District to continue its collaboration on the Blandings Turtle Head Start Project. Uh, so they're making a lot of progress with the Blandings. Um, part of the reason, and Cheryl talks about this in the article, part of the reason that the turtles have declined so much in Illinois is a loss of nesting spots. As things get paved over, as more and more um, ponds get drained, get uh, get things next to, you know, housing developments next to ponds, for example. Well, this is what we call this, habitat this is, loss. This yeah. is this yeah, is habitat, habitat loss. loss. That's it. That's yeah, the so definition the turtles, of it. The turtles are now having to cross roads. The females, as they're going to lay eggs, they're crossing roads. They're getting run over. They might be building nests right next to roads, right in areas that are flooding. And so they're trying to do some different things through the different forest preserve districts and the various museums and the other entities. And like you say, it is having some success. So you can read that article in the July issue of NA Chicago. And when I'm done talking, I'll put that link up. All but, right. No, uh, no, that's great. Yeah. That, that's one of the great stories you've got. Um, and uh, I, I, some of the others, uh, I notice it's um, uh, worse. Ah, and I've lost track. Well, while we're talking forest preserve districts, I'll I'll talk about Lake County. Yes, please which is do. Also covered, yeah, covered in the July issue. The Lake County Forest Preserves are leading in net zero building. Um, as stewards of healthy landscapes and proponents of climate resiliency, officials at Lake County Forest Preserves altered their capital improvement plan to prioritize and accelerate current net zero building goals and lead the way for others to do the same. Um, so this would be a zero energy building producing enough renewable energy to meet its own annual energy consumption requirements. Um, Ryerson Conservation Area in Riverwoods, they're currently working with design architects to replace aging classroom cabins with new net zero environmental education centers and other buildings. And then they're also working in Wakanda and some of the other forest preserves to do the same. So. Um, Hopefully some of the other forest preserve districts here and, and elsewhere will will pick up that zero uh, zero build or net zero building techniques. And I've also and I also noticed that it's uh, National Bison Month at Medewin, mm -hmm. National Tall Grass Prairie. Uh, they're celebrating their twenty fifth anniversary this year. We've had uh, some of those folks on the show a couple of times uh, this year yeah. to talk about that. But uh, um, it's it's the coolest thing that they've got bison there and you know it's about it's about figuring and get letting them in the prairie uh they browse in a completely different way from what uh cattle do and uh which means that they're experimenting there to see what kind of forbs and grasses survive the browsing and and see if it actually helps prairie plantings out right. at, at Medewin. Yeah, and the different levels of plants. And Medewin's celebrating all year. You can actually go to the Medewin website. Um, you can go to uh, Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. Just Google that. It's it's long. It's too long to just read off here. They right. have things happening every month, virtually and some in person as well. But they've got, if you go through our calendar and Natural Awakenings and Printer Online, we've got a ton of different things happening with Daywin all the time. Veronica Hinky, who we've had on this program, um, is really great at sending all of their calendar information for us. It's uh, it's an awfully cool place, and now would be yeah. a, a pretty good time to go down there and visit, I would guess. Um, oh, gosh, 
we're out of time, but we should, I should just keep you going. Cause I'm enjoying this. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just like, I'm sipping. I'm sipp sitting back and I'm doing the talking. I'm sipping my coffee here. It's like, yeah, you just, yeah, just keep talking. Just keep talking. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so well, we let me pop up the link right here to our July issue for natural awakenings. I'll put that right in there, but you can always go to nachicago.com. And also, if you've got ideas for stories, if things we should be covering, it doesn't have to be in print. We do a lot of updates on the website throughout the month on our social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, um, Peggy some is, ideas. If, if there's stuff out there that you want Pe covered, let me know. Peggy's very responsive. Like we are to this show, you send us ideas and we try to do what we can. Um, well, I'll tell you one idea before we break here is uh, I had um, – Catherine Forrest last week has sent, you got to talk about that bird disease that is making the rounds in the United States. And it's really scary. It, it, it reminds me of the uh, white nose bat syndrome yeah. that uh, uh, has plagued bats for now years. And uh, birds are having this thing where they get, they get crust around their eyes and they're weakened and yeah, um, they can't see. It's easily spread uh, because uh, that's why you're, you're supposed to uh, keep track of your bird feeders, keep track of your, um, in fact, some people are saying don't put bird feeders out. And if you've got um, uh, bird baths, uh, clean them regularly keep with a 10% 10 per, 10 bleach solution um, just to make sure that this disease doesn't spread. They really don't know what it is. Yeah. No. Um, and it's so, just kind of appeared. Yeah. So if I can give a shout, shout out to Marta. Okay. Um, who reminds me, as she says, love the email edition of Natural Awakenings too. Hey, nhchicago.com, please subscribe to our e-newsletter list. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and, thanks, <coughs> and thank you for allowing me to promote and plug our current issues. We will do some more next week because you didn't get through all the great articles that are in there this month. And uh, we will. this is a new segment we'll do on a regular basis. Uh, when we return, it is, oh, guess what? It's just you and me again. So we've got a bunch of things we want to talk about. And I'll tell you what, uh, if folks uh, want to send us messages now, uh, because uh, we're going to chat for a half hour before we get to uh, Rick DeMaio, um, let us know what you want to chat about, too. And uh, uh, we will do that. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we will be right back. Hi, I'm Vic Nakashima with Bartlett Tree Experts. Let me ask you something. Have you ever considered having a professional arborist prune your trees? You and your trees will benefit from it, and I can show you why. Follow me. One of the more common reasons for pruning is the removal of dead branches. Now, in truth, with a little help from the wind, a branch like this would simply break off and fall on its own, but in a very uncontrolled way. And a branch this size falling from this height could be a very serious hazard. Our team of arborists through pruning will ensure that these branches make it to the ground in a safe way. Stand clear. All clear. When necessary, we can use ropes and rigging gear to control branches once they're cut, protecting anything of value that might lie below. You'll notice that when a branch simply breaks off on its own, it usually leaves behind a stub. And it seems harmless enough, but this is actually now an impediment to the tree's natural process to close over that wound. By making a precision cut, an experienced arborist can expedite that process, shielding this site from pests and decay. When these lateral branches grow too long, they can actually become too heavy and break. But we know how to prune to reduce the weight and almost eliminate this risk. And we can also prune them to make sure that they don't contact your house while still keeping the tree's health and beauty intact. Stand clear. All clear. Worried about your tree blowing over in the wind? We can selectively remove live branches so that strong winds will pass through your tree's canopy more easily. You know, hazard reduction is important, but pruning can also provide harmony to your landscape. 
These lower branches are blocking the sun and shading out this garden. And the lawn is suffering as well. By pruning these branches, we can raise the crown and achieve the goal of sunlight. It may surprise you to know that Bartlett Tree Experts also specializes in the pruning of ornamentals. There's a lot to consider when you're pruning a tree like this, and we do it every day. So, whether it's fruit trees, shrubs, young trees, or mature, Bartlett Tree Experts can provide all your pruning needs. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup song of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root of bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. Give me all that I can take. And welcome back to the show. I got I got to have to say something about uh, uh, Vic Nakashima. He's uh, he's a stud. Um, <laughs> say what? Uh, well, I, I I know more than one person who who loves watching those commercials because they like watching him and he's rappelling through the trees, you know. And I'm like, okay, cool. I wish I could do that. I mean, that, I love that the zip the, the where he goes up and down the tree, and then you know down, what? I bet Scott and Skeet could arrange for you to do that. Uh, I bet they could not because you need a lot of training for that. So um, no, with with the with control. Everything. Yeah, they pick me up at by a the height of ten and ten feet <laughs> by the scruff of the neck, uh, up, up, up into the tree, and they would say, uh, "Stay away from that branch. Don't think that you can prune that." Um, just oh, to... oh, we'll be back for you later. Bye. <laughs> They'll, I would be the guy at the bottom of the tree going, "All clear," you know, and then, oh wait, I got to get out of the way. Wait, I got to get out of the way. Oh boy, but that's you know. <laughs> Safety first. That that is what they do. At Safety Bartlett. first. Don't let Mike up into the tree. Exactly. Don't let him anywhere near a pruner. Certainly not a chainsaw. I'm. How's your finger doing, by the way? My finger is great. Okay. I. Uh, there it is. It's. Uh, there it is. It's, Ow. It's. Yeah, I know. I just tried to cut the whole thing off, but uh, other than that, it's it's healing rather nicely. So uh, <laughs> I think I'm good to go. Uh, yikes. Yeah. Uh, you, 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 speaking of trees and waste, you had some misadventures in your yard recently too, didn't you? With, um, yardscape, uh, yard landscape waste. Oh, I have to tell you while we're talking. Okay. Oh, and we got, we got likes from Skeet here. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you understand Skeet. Um, don't let him by the, way, the trees. I, I'll get to that story in a second, but, um, uh, I want to thank folks for all the, the, the great messages that have been coming in during uh, uh, Deb and Justin's uh, segment. And uh, obviously, we really couldn't get to many of them because they were on a, on a, a short time frame. And I wanted to make sure that they got to say everything they wanted to say about um, handling water in Chicago, which is just the tip of the iceberg, no pun intended. Um, or, 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 I guess, uh, pun intended um but uh don't be a jerk okay there we go um but uh dan costa writes with more people ordering goods online parking lots could be reduced make open spaces that can become garden beds not just tree islands with suffering trees and some ground covers and that's a really good point we have acres and acres and acres of asphalt i have to tell you every time i see in the city somebody repaving a parking lot with asphalt my head explodes because i think there you you missed opportunity to let some of that water percolate this is why we flood folks this is why we flood um and i know it costs more I and say, um, there's a huge cost difference cost uh, and time difference y yeah but the cost, we're not looking at the future cost and we're not looking at the cost of a flood that affects yeah. 
hundreds or thousands of homes in a, a, a municipal area, metropolitan area, because we did not allow permeable pavers to be in that parking lot. Um, and I, and again, I think we need to go back to some, um, some uh, extended producer responsibility, and in this case, extended uh, corporate responsibility yeah. for the box stores of the world that continue to make box stores, and then they go out of business, and the box store sits there, and the parking lot sits there, and it's just shoveling all. Yeah. We what we do is we turn ra- uh, rainwater, we turn a valuable resource into pollution, into sewage, because it goes down and it often it mixes with all the other. And the other it thing picks is up everything on the pavement, exactly. everything on the streets, and it all goes into the sewer system. I had a, um, it was Deb, our friend Deb, who watches the show a lot, wrote to me right after the 4th of July. And she said, what about all of those exploded and unexploded uh, fireworks that are washing into? And I thought, you know, I I don't think there I've ever seen a study, but I can't imagine that mixing exploded and unexploded gunpowder <laughs> into our water is a good thing. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know. No, it probably isn't uh, volatile, but it's not good. Um, yeah. I mean, we just I'm- add we add all these things when you wash your car in the street. But one of the reasons you probably shouldn't wash your car in the street. The detergent goes down there. The oils go down there. It all goes in. Um, this is why, and and folks are trying to save a buck, and I get it. Everybody needs to save a buck. They don't want to go to the car wash, but a lot of these car washes now capture that water, I and it. and yeah. it gets treated. Yeah. Um, Let's, you know, going back to the permeable, because um, I'm reading the comments from Kathleen and from, from Kathleen Parrish and from Mac about subsidizing permeable driveways. I'm wondering, I have not read the infrastructure plan to any any depth. I wonder if there's anything for subsidizing permeables and looking at that whole paving over America in any of the plans. Oh, I you know, there must be. See, we're not thinking outside of the box here in that way. We, we're still, our solutions are still... Uh, Deborah Shore alluded to this, our our 20th century and sometimes 19th century and sometimes 18th century Mm -hmm. solutions. But I love the idea of subsidizing permeable driveways and pavers and parking lots. Um, And as Max says, broader public education. Well, education, education, education is is, uh, a big deal, letting people know. But because you you can't... You can't advocate for it if you don't know about it. And changing the expectations of what a parking lot is. Yeah. And Dennis says, uh, with the latest technology and materials, permeable paving is not that much more expensive than conventional paving. See, I don't know what those costs are. Um, and there's things like, well, and in Zan posts driveway solutions besides permeables that are less expensive as well. There's French drains. There's a lot of different things to capture, hold, or delay water mm-hmm. and flooding. Uh, but if you're going to have a, a 500 or a thousand year event, and there's no reason that couldn't happen here, or oh, I tell you what, that's the question for Rick DeMaio when he's on in a few minutes is could. Mm-hmm. That event, I first of all, I'm going to ask him what happened there in Europe. What was what were the confluence of events and and fronts and whatever was going on that led to that rainfall, that yeah. catastrophic rainfall? Now, in Germany, Germany Switzerland, the Netherlands, mountains, Belgium. mountains exacerbated it because it's all funneling down. Here in Chicago, as we know, our problem is we're too flat. You know, yeah. you could be and and I saw earlier that. Um, uh, Ernest out in uh, Portland, Oregon. Oh gosh, let me find his comment. Uh, yes, says Portland often has problems with sewage overflow. I'm seeing a lot of bio swells incorporated into new street construction to capture rainwater. Um, but uh, what I want to say, Ernest, you guys have hills, you have mountains there, mm-hmm. and in sh- Chicago, uh, there ain't nothing. It's the you know what the mountain is here? It's, it's Ridge Road um, because yeah. Green you know, Bay and Ridge, yeah, Green Bay, and one side is Narragansett. And it's amazing that that's the divide 
between the mm-hmm. Mississippi watershed yeah. and the Great Lakes watershed. Yeah. And it's this little rise. It's just this little rise. And, and and that's also a huge difference right around Chicago because it is so close where the, the split, the continental divide, as it were, between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi is real close. The rest of the Great Lakes, it's far away from the lakes. Right. It's just it's, it, topography. It's the way that topography works. So uh, just uh, great comments, folks. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, while, I, while we're talking about that, and, 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 yes. I was going to say we got a survey to talk about too, but go right, ahead. exactly. Well, let's let's talk about that because it's it's in the same ballpark. So we have just launched a survey, uh, and we're going to post it on all of our social media. We're going to send out a newsletter this week with the I'm survey in it. But don't but don't assume that you're going to get the newsletter and then click it. Um, start working on and it make now. Make sure you're signed up for it. If you're not signed up for the newsletter, so go to the. Mike Novak show, go to the homepage on the right side. It, there's a very simple place to sign up for the newsletter um, and go to YouTube. So we're, <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm just learning all kinds of things about YouTube. Some I want to know and some I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> but um, we're, as I said, we're still migrating in that direction. I know a lot of you watch us on Facebook and for now that's cool. And uh, we're just trying to Figure out the future of the show. So one of the ways we do that is is a survey. Um, and we have uh, a survey that is now posted at MikeNovak.net. Go to the homepage, which says Watch the Show. Uh, that Ka- link up here. Kathleen has put right at the top of the page uh, the survey. Go to the survey. Uh, we did one of these a year ago. And this is kind of a follow-up to that. But especially since we've been uh, floating... <laughs> We floating, floating, yeah, sort of drifting in the inner tubes. Um, and uh, we want folks to tell us what they like, what they don't like. Um, and, and don't what you be want af- to hear more of what you never want to hear again, right? Exactly. Um, and I know sometimes what they don't want to hear again is don't be a jerk. Okay, there we go. Um, but uh, we want you to fill that out, and uh, we're, we're gonna. Take a little time and, and see how many responses we yeah. can get that. And, and we're, we're looking at, we're having meetings, we're looking at things, we're having marketing meetings, blah, 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 blah. Um, um, and I think some of the questions that we really want to, we, we want to hear answers for is, do you want to listen to us for two hours? Would you rather listen to short podcast segments? Would you rather watch us on YouTube? all of the above do you want to have us over for a barbecue in your yard you know what what are you looking for yeah because we're we're not we're not dumb we're not unaware of of things we know that um on the internet shorter segments are what a lot of people do uh even with podcasts a lot of podcasts are 30 minutes long we know this is a long show it's two hours it's sort of a, a a holdover or even a hangover from uh, radio days, well, it, in a sense, it could be, you know. Um, and we're trying to move into the 21st century uh, and accommodate uh, everyone who wants to view the show. Of course, the the answer to that is you don't have to watch the whole show. If you watch a half hour, that's mm-hmm. that's up to you. Uh, but uh, what I would say is uh, the one of the things that will really help us is tell your friends if you like what you see. Please get them to subscribe to us. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, please do it right now. Just, I'd love to see a bump right now uh, on this Sunday um, because that's uh, probably where we're going to end up. Um, um, uh, uh, for, for various reasons, YouTube is more friendly to uh, live streaming than Facebook is. Um, and Apple Podcasts, where we already are. So yep. if you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any of the other podcasts, but especially Apple and Spotify, please go in, like the show, download the show, and give us some ratings, give us some comments. Right. Uh, and, that and, helps bump us up in the wonderful world of algorithms. Oh, boy. Don't we love algorithms. <laughs> um, so, um, well, there, here's something cool. It's uh, Well, the Kathleen writes, uh, I think your transition was better than Mighty House. Now, don't get me wrong. We love Mighty House. Ron Cogill is my buddy. I lost track of Mighty House, but I find you through Facebook. Um, yeah, well, Mighty House is, I think they've basically gone 
strictly to YouTube, but I'll tell you, YouTube they're doing letters, yeah. and they're doing very well. Uh, Mighty House, uh, in fact, uh, I, I'm going to encourage you to go watch it there. And they've gone to like 15 minute segments. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's their whole deal. Um, and uh, I get that. I kind of uh, they don't do live anymore. Um, one of the things uh, I like, and I don't even know if Peggy likes this, but I love doing live radio i love doing live streaming uh there's something about the energy here about uh being on the high wire without a net uh and you guys know you've suffered through this uh in the early part of when we were making the transition but as you can see most of that's gone and the only time we have issues is usually it's on the other end when the guest stream breaks up as you saw a little bit with deb but it wasn't too bad so we were fine but you see that on national television as well so it's um everybody's got that issue here uh, so anyway, fill out the, uh, go to MikeNovak.net, um, and, and I, as I said before, we're going to post it on our various social media. Um, fill out the survey. That's really going to be helpful to us as we move forward and figure out where we belong, if we belong, uh, in the conversation uh, uh, about doing live shows, uh, doing any kind of show. Um, it, you know, I hope you're interested in environmental issues. There's not a lot of programs out there like ours. Um and uh, we hope uh, you want us to stick around. Um, okay, uh, let's. Uh, so we the have other a composting thing... event to get to too. Yes, let's do that. Uh, have you got it, or do I? Yeah. So um, this comes from our friend of the show, Sarah Bodka, or Sarah Christine Bodka, as her email pops up. Um, home. They are. I'm looking at her press release, which is just too long here. So <laughs> I can June, find it if you uh, can. Saturday, July 24th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Illinois Extension is having a community compost collection series. It's the number four in their series for this year, for 2021. Um, it's going to be in Homewood, Village Hall parking lot, 2020 Chestnut Road in Homewood. Again, Saturday, July 24th from 9 to 12. Sponsored in part by the Home Green Homewood and the Homewood Science Center, and additional support from Gotham Greens. And this is going to be an opportunity for you to bring various things in for composting and then get a bucket of compost to take back home with you. So we encourage you to take part in the composting efforts from uh, the uh, Illinois Extension. And Sarah works mm -hmm. very hard to get these things done. Um, she said the one they had down at the plant was very successful er yeah. earlier in the year. Yeah. And they're trying to match that again. Um, and it's tough because you go to various yeah. suburbs and try to make that work and have everybody bring their compo, which leads us to I my was story. Say, bring grass clippings, leaves, landscape waste, and kitchen scraps such as eggshells, vegetable skins, and stems. They don't want branches over two inches in diameter or any products containing oil dressing, dairy, produce stickers, meat, or bones. And again, this is in Homewood, and you can get more information on the Extensions website. Right. Uh, you don't have a link that you can post there? Uh, I can pop that right up. It's a face. Um, the easiest thing is the Facebook link, which I will pop up That's right That's a great here. idea. Uh, right. And um, um, I'm glad you oh, said Oh, yeah, and Sega. We just got prompt to talk about Sega, too. <laughs> I know. That was going to be one of the things we were going to talk about. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, or maybe Legata type that in there. I'm wondering if uh, I was going to do Legata cam, but she has disappeared again. So there's nothing. She's upstairs. She doesn't want to deal with this show. Uh, see now if Legata filled out our survey, uh, we would not get good ratings. That, that would not happen. Um, the 60 second garden video challenge from Chicago excellence and gardening awards is still going on. Um, we want you to enter. Uh, we want you to be part. You got till the end of August, but don't wait. Get it done right now. Go to chicagogardeningawards.org and uh, read the instructions. Basically, take your cell phone out to your yard. Do 60 seconds. Put some music behind it. You might win valuable Wally prizes. Put in a dancing cat. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I might do that. I'm, I, But I'm not eligible. Um, and... Um, the uh, entry's been a little slow this year. I'm, I'm going to be straightforward and say it's been a little slow. I think folks are in, and like I said, they're in that in-between. They don't know if they're in quarantine or if they're not in quarantine. and they're, But they're out gardening, and it's mm -hmm. been a weird gardening year. Oh, yeah. uh, my tomatoes are slow. Um, we had somebody ask when to harvest a cucumber. 
And my, when my, they're ready. When they're ripe, yeah. No, but you know, it's hard to tell because yeah. we have a long Chinese cucumber out there. And uh, the last one we harvested, uh, we nailed it perfectly. And I think uh, this one's like ready in two days. It's, boy, it, it takes a little bit of experience. I don't, is if somebody knows, maybe Dan Costa or somebody out there knows what the perfect cucumber um, uh, ripening trick is, um, I kind of look at the size. I mean, we've got some pickling cucumbers back there. We just harvested one yesterday that I think it's possible we waited a little too long, but it sure tasted good. So maybe we didn't, yeah. you know, if you want a pickling cucumber, you want it the size of a pickle and that's when you harvest it, yeah. but you can let it grow bigger. Um, it, the, the seeds will get bigger and yeah, you know, it, that's part that's of it too. Day. Yeah. And sometimes um, they get more bitter depending on the variety. So, uh, if anybody's got a tip out there, send it and we'll, we'll pass that along. Uh, but the, you know, if you got a vegetable garden, if you got a flower garden, enter the 60 second garden video challenge, uh, and you just, uh, upload it and we take a look at it and put it up on the YouTube page and folks, and then you got to get your friends to click like that's the key. So the mo the ones with the most likes will be the people's choice. Yes. People's choice. That's the way uh, we're we're doing that. Uh, so we got that plug out of the way. Okay, real quick because we only got a couple of minutes here. Speaking of composting, I took the bull by the horns. I got I finally got frustrated. Kathleen and I were out cleaning some stuff out of the garage. Uh, we took some stuff to scarce. We took some stuff to. Uh, Kane County, because they were going out to visit a friend, and um, that would that would be uh, styrofoam, correct? No, we didn't get that out. That would have been Aurora if we went to Dart Corporation, where they recycle uh, polystyrene, expanded polystyrene. But uh, Kathleen and Mac went out to um, uh, Kane County to their recycling center in Batavia, um, and thanks to uh, Jennifer Jarlin, who has alerted us to their new recycling. Uh, in Aurora. Um, and so we figured, why not? I mean, we're not citizens. <laughs> we don't live there, but they'll still take some of your stuff. Um, and, and then, so I looked at the bags of yard waste and I said, Oh, okay. I'm going to break down. I'm going to call three one one. I'm going to get the city to pick this up. And I hope they pick it up because you uh -oh. know how much I trust the city of Chicago to, uh, to do recycling. And, and we mentioned earlier that there's a new study by the Delta Institute about strategies that the city can use. That, that long-awaited report came out. We're going to talk about that in the next couple of weeks, about what the city can do to increase its recycling rate. One of the, one of the suggestions, believe it or not, was reinstitute the Department of the Environment. Surprise! Wow! wow. How about that? I'm shocked. Yeah, shocked. really. I'm shocked. One of it was better metrics. No, you got to be kidding me. Ugh. Um, metrics going on here? Shocked. I'm shocked. You know, tracking. And oh my goodness. Uh, but another thing was um, reduce. Stop buying all that garbage. And that, and that puts it on, That's the, the onus there is on the uh, consumer. Yeah. You know, stop. Stop buying all that with all the crazy packaging. So anyway, so I call 311 and I say, okay, can you pick this up? I tried to get on, do it on the phone. And after the whole day, I went, it said, go to the website. What? Fine. I'd rather go to the website. So I go to the website, the 311 website and, and fill out the stuff. And after I fill it out, it says your yard waste will be picked up in within seven days. I thought, well, wait a second. Monday will be garbage pickup. If I leave my yard waste out there, I know what's happening. It'll end up in the garbage with, with the garbage pickup. So that meant, okay, well, then I have to think Sunday night, I got to go out and move the bags back in the garage so it doesn't end up in the garbage. Because I figured it's going to take all of seven days for them to get this. Well, the day I made the order, it was going to rain overnight. I went, oh, I can't leave these paper bags out in the rain because they'll turn to mush. So I move them in the garage. And they'll definitely wind up in the garbage truck. Exactly. So the next day, I'm talking to Peggy. I'm on the phone, and I get this phone call, and I look, and it's 
773 number. I go, I don't recognize that. Boom. Well, fortunately, it pops up on my inbox. And I went, wow, wonder who that is. And it's the Streets and Sand guy. He says, I'm out in the alley, but there, I don't see any bags. I went, ah. I said, Peggy, Peggy, I got to hang up. I got to hang up. <laughs> got to go. I got to go. Got to go. And I call right back. Do, 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 do. Um, hey, 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 um, um, I'm here. Um, I, I moved him in the garage because it was going to rain last night. I said, can you pick him up? He said, well, I'm not there anymore. I said, well, I'll see if I can circle back. I went, oh, please. Okay, I'm moving him out. So I move him out immediately into the alley. And then I called him again. I said, they're out in the alley. He says, okay, uh, maybe I can be there in about an hour. So an hour later, I check, and the bags are still there. Uh, two hours later, I check. The bags are gone. Uh, now, wow. I, didn't get, I didn't get to see what kind of truck they picked them up. I assume it was, you know, I'm going to take, you know, I, what, what I wanted to do is sit out there truck. in my lawn chair with a, with, a, with a drink and just wait and just see and then take photos, but I don't have time to do that. But uh, so um, need the streets and sand cam. And, and I have to tell um, Nancy Bender, one of our uh, uh, faithful listeners and, and viewers, told me this a few months ago. She said, you should give it a try. You should try it because they, they, they picked it up for me. So I'm like, OK, so there you go. Uh, my yard waste is out of the garage. Yay. And uh, and with any luck, it's actually being composted somewhere in the universe. So it, the 311 worked, but I still disagree with the whole 311 plan, which is totally opt in in the city of Chicago. They should have a regular pickup. You should be able to just leave it there. I understand money, logistics, all that stuff. But um, at least this time they came through. It looks like the city of Chicago. So I got to give credit where credit is due. The city picked up my yard waste and um, I might try it again. I might, ooh, I might do it twice. All right. We need to break because Rick DeMaio is coming in. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we'll talk weather and climate when we come back. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. If you currently live on Earth and would like to continue to do so, please listen closely as this applies to you. Climate change is real, it is dangerous, and it is happening now before us all. Climate change does not discriminate towards region or race and endangers us all. Our carbon dioxide levels are the highest we've seen in 650,000 years. Sea levels have risen 3 millimeters annually. Our global temperature is rapidly rising. We've seen a record number of natural disasters than ever before. Earth as we know it is and will continue to change forever. Could you imagine going for a walk in 140 degree weather? If you can't, then it's time for you to get serious about the impact of climate change and what you can do to stop it. Each day brings us closer to an irreversible fate unless we step up now. This is not a problem for your grandchildren's grandchildren. This is a problem for you and your future on this earth. Visit climatechange.nasa.gov for more information about climate change and what you can do to make an impact. Climate change is a big issue, but it starts with you. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. There he is, meteorologist Rick DeMaio. Good morning, Rick. How you doing? Good morning, Peg. Good morning, Mike. How are you? I'm doing fine. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Um, another, geez, like every, every week. It, this is a good time to be a meteorologist, isn't it? Or maybe a bad time. I don't know, Rick. It's a bad time because you're taking me away from watching the British Open live. Shame oh. on you. 
I, you know what? There's nothing I can do. You know, it because of the time. I, I'm gonna. I get off of here. I'm gonna be watching. The, you 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 only want to start watching it at uh, eleven o'clock anyway. So that's no, what it's, it's too nice no. to be watching TV. Be outside. All right. What if I? Oh, what if I, I, I? I agree with you, Peg. But when you can watch the best golfers in the world do what Mike and I do all the time, it feels much better. <laughs> oh, if you get are a few people doing that today? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. What, what I like play? watching. Go on, Peg. I, Go on, say, Peg. I like watching network broadcasting where their remote things break up too. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I've been there before <laughs> where you're in the middle of doing something and all of a sudden you look like you're just talking and you're, you're, you're like Marcel Marceau. Nothing's coming out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Um, no, I remember many times when I was doing live shots at Navy Pier, and I would get there, and the, the the camera person put the monitor literally so that the sun was shining right on it, and I'm looking, I'm like, I can't see anything. So basically, it was me <laughs> talking to a camera, and I hope that what I'm saying is matching what the people on the other side are seeing. So yeah, there were some frustrating moments. <laughs> That's up to them. But, you know, if you start talking, they got to match the uh, the graphics to what you're hey, saying. Um, hey, Mike, speaking yeah. of graphics, there's something really weird going on with mine. Oh, oh, yeah, I think I can <laughs> fix that. You're right. It's uh, you know what? I don't know why, but these things tend to shift every now and then. And, and, and I don't know. They shouldn't. Um, no, it's layered. There's one on top of the other. Yeah, no, I know that. And uh, it's it's part oh, of. Uh, it I think it shows that you're a very deep person when you're there layered like that. I'm multidimensional. Right. Yeah, let's <laughs> see if, if I do yeah. this. How about that? That's better, huh? Oh, and then, we're oh, I see. To do that while, we're, while we're broadcasting coast to coast Anyways. Right Yeah, oh, well, it is what it it's is. It's not an easy fix. We'll get it later. <laughs> no, it's it's tough because uh, these things uh, shift around. And I, I'll, I'll try doing this while, while we're uh, talking to Rick. But uh, uh, Rick, you know, I... Speaking before, Mike, Mike, real quickly... Speaking of why I'd love to watch the British Open, Peg, yeah. is that uh, right now their weather has actually been nicer than ours, and they've had uh, literally a nice, beautiful, dry last three or four days. Yeah, um, eighty degrees currently in Sandwich, uh, England, which is actually southeast of London, and the bay that kind of loops around uh, the coast. There's an inlet, and on the other side of the inlet are the famous white cliffs of Dover. And from one of the shots, I think, Mike, it was the seventh hole. It's a long par four. You can actually see the white cliffs of Dover. Hmm. And they're actually a really great example of talking about changing climate because about 140 million years ago when the Earth's um, temperature was about 10 degrees warmer centigrade, uh, there were no ice sheets and sea levels were about 30 to 40 feet higher. That area of the southeast part of England was literally all packed in uh, with, you know, marine species that had died in the past. And then once you had some uplift and then some shifting of the plates, and then literally we cooled off and the oceans uh, went back to where they are now, um, they exposed, you know, marine sediment and marine organisms, you know, from the past. So oftentimes the White Cliffs of Dover uh, is a really good example to talk about what we can learn about past climates from what we can see now. Kind of like that mm -hmm. geomorphology uh, approach. So it's really cool. I've never been to that part of England, but I hear it's it's quite fascinating. It's it's. I think I saw it once uh, when I was in high school. We did a trip. My, my choir did a trip to England, and we went to Calais, uh, which is – right across the straits there it was very very cool yeah. so uh, i've seen the straits yeah um so, so oftentimes when i get when i ask rebecca can you switch over to the u.s open uh it's usually because um uh not 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 the US Open, but any sports event like last week i said can you go to the all-star game i want to see what the lightning looks like east of denver and she's like <laughs> Clicks over. She's like, "There's no lightning." I'm like, "That's okay. There will be some in a minute." And I get to sneak in baseball for about two or three minutes. Um, but uh, and then she she gets on pretty quickly. There was no lightning anywhere near them. I just wanted to watch the game for a little bit. Yeah, subterfuge. 
Uh, all right. So I fixed it a little bit. It's still not. I, I, it will yeah. take more than I can do right here, later. Peggy. So, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, I want to pop up a, a photo here, a couple of photos, Rick, because uh, uh, these are, you know, you're talking about Europe and just not even that far away. We've got devastation like this. Oh, yeah. That's from the that's from the New York Times. Uh, I I was just blown away from uh, by that uh, shot of the street that is completely wiped away by the floods. You probably saw the videos of I saw one of a dumpster just yeah. uh, being tumbling down the street and these narrow streets, um, unlike we have here. Uh, here's another shot, um, and uh, 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 yet another one. Of the this, complete... is in, this is in Germany, just to let your listeners know. This is in Germany. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this is a churchyard here. Um, unbelievable. The, the court... yeah. Sorry. And again, yeah, this now... is concentrated around the Rhine River and in Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and, and Belgium, the worst of the flooding. Right, yeah, kind of like northwestern areas of Germany because Germany is quite large. Um, so to put it into perspective, if this was the Midwest – and the Mississippi River was like the western area, the Midwest. This part of Germany is like like Galena. It's that far northwest. Um, but you can also see in that shot, um, you know, a lot of these roads in these older towns, uh, there's very little greenery. Um, it's a lot of asphalt and concrete. So when you get heavy rain, uh, the water becomes very narrow, very fo focused, very fast. Um, and all you do is you know, begin to eat away at some of the soil um, underneath concrete, and boom, it just washes away. Um, in addition to that, the second photograph you showed, I think Peg mentioned the churchyard, you got a lot of mountains in the area, and they've had a very wet spring and equally a very wet first part of summer. So I think it was like, yeah, the six, so you can see the mountains. So clearly the water is focusing from the right to the left. Um, I don't know much about the meteorology behind it. In other words, I didn't really do much detail analysis of this particular event. But from what I can tell, I mean, over 200 people, I think, um, are known dead. And in one small town, I think there's still several hundred that are missing. I saw. And, I, heard, I heard that there's 1,300 people still missing. Yeah, yeah, I, I heard that too. And, and who knows, because, you know, a lot of times in places in Europe, people, they go on holiday, as they call it. And they may be gone for a month, and they may not have a chance to check in or anything like that. I don't know. But, yeah, it, it's catastrophic nonetheless. Um, is it related to climate change? I don't know. I'd have to go back and kind of look at the pattern. Uh, but, you know, quietly the numbers are adding up. Um, over 200 people, I believe, in the state of Oregon, about 150 um, in the state of Washington, and at least over 200 in British Columbia due to the heat. And those numbers will always add, will always get higher, um, kind of like a flood, because it's not something that's catastrophic where the people who died are still in the places where they were. Flooding, you'll generally be either pulled away or covered up with debris. Tornadoes are usually where you were when it happened. Uh, fire, usually where you were when it happened. Heat, um, oftentimes it could be a week later, then all of a sudden, you know, if you're elderly, sick, you feel worse than you did the week before and the heat related illness could take like a week to sometimes two weeks uh, or sometimes old people you know they die in their homes and people don't know about it because they have no one visiting them so again these are events that are obviously weather related are they linked to a changing climate the flooding i don't know the heat wave for sure they are uh okay well the new york times claims that uh this is um climate related uh a lot of folks are, are saying that right now i i'm trying to imagine all right the question i was going to have for you which i asked earlier in the show could this happen in the midwest now we don't have the mountains so there's not going to be the funneling of all that right. water um yeah, but the, the answer quickly is is no i don't think you can get catastrophic flooding like that that quick usually our flooding here when it does occur it happens over a long period of time and if it doesn't it happens in low-lying areas where people usually can get out. But the worst quick flash flooding or fastest flash, flash flooding I've ever seen is usually in Colorado, places like Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, Boulder, 
where you have canyons and you get that westerly moving thunderstorm that comes in from the east and eastern Colorado and eastern New Mexico have been very, very wet. So I would not be surprised if something does occur in the months of August and September, because that's usually when you get some of the worst flooding is that's because the, the land has really soaked up a lot of the, the heavier rain. And the flooding that occurred in Boulder in 2013 was the first week of September. And it was literally a four inch rainfall that filled in Boulder Canyon and Boulder Canyon became a torrent of water. Now, a lot of people didn't die, but there was massive, massive infrastructure damage. And if you look at Boulder Creek now, that whole area has been completely rebuilt to withstand the flood. So they've obviously thought ahead of times and said, we're not going to wait until this happens again. They rebuilt to withstand the flood. Um, you think back in, well, not think back, but 1976, it was, I think, July 6th or 7th. You had the worst flood in the history of Colorado, which was the big Thompson River Canyon flood that killed over 270 people because literally a dam gave way and a wall of water and mud uh, basically overran a campsite. That campsite now no longer exists because clearly it's vulnerable to flooding. So anytime you get mountains and heavy rain in a very, very small area in a short amount of time, you'll get catastrophic flooding. But I don't think that can happen in the Midwest. We're too flat here. Um. Uh, we were earlier in the show, we had uh, MWRD Commissioner Deborah Shore on, and we were talking about uh, how they mitigate that in the Chicago area. And it's a real balancing act. I mean, it is uh, op opening the sluice gates and letting the water run down and sometimes letting it run. And then we got deep tunnel and we got the, uh, the, the re now the reservoirs. We, 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 we showed the video of the McCook Reservoir filling to the yeah. top. Uh, back right. in early 2018, and it's really terrifying, actually, to realize there's that. There are two, she said, three billion uh, gallons of water in, in that yeah. reservoir. Yeah, and I, and I think the total is like 25 billion is what the is what the deep tunnel is supposed to hold eventually. I think, I think it's in that ballpark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of that might be after the second reservoir opens in, later in this right. decade. Yeah, and, I mean, and she said and, that really won't be enough either. Right. I mean, it, and, and, you know, it's interesting because they just had this, you know, climate conference in the Midwest. And again, I, you know, I, I saw some of the remarks of Lori, of Mayor Lightfoot. Um, and I think they were kind of off the mark because she went right off the bat and said, you know, climate change will produce higher lake levels. Well, that's not true. What she should have said was climate change will, will produce highly fluctuating lake levels which makes developing a short-term plan even difficult. So we have to think more medium and long-term for not just short-term plans, but for, or not for just rising lake levels, but for rapidly shrinking lake levels, because that's what happened back in 2012 when certain, you know, boat owners couldn't even use their, um, couldn't even use their harbors. So again, it's easy to point to something that is, that is most recent, which is rising lake levels, but do just a little bit more research, have your talking points reviewed by someone who's a little bit more knowledgeable on this stuff, and, and don't hit a, a double or a triple, but hit a home run, and say that, it, as we've seen in the past, it's not just rising lake levels, but as we've all seen, it's rapidly falling lake levels, and therefore you just don't do something to fix one problem, you do something to fix potentially two problems. And I think with that, she could have sounded a little bit more aware of the fact that, okay, we just spent all this money rebuilding the lake wall uh, in Northwestern and in parts of Chicago, but now the lake is down. So you don't want people to go, okay, why did we do this? Because now the lake is down. It makes it seem like all you're doing is you're running around putting out fires as opposed to preventing them. Uh, that's a really good point, and we—you'll be happy to know that we channeled you early on, and it, it, the uh, fluctuating uh, lake levels and uh, yeah. climate climate variability are things that we addressed. And 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 to her credit, Deborah Shore is very aware of this. She's she's very smart and and, and knows that the issue is not just things getting higher and higher, the water level getting higher and higher, but the the fluctuation. Uh, of the levels and so um that was uh it was a really really good conversation um yeah. 
I want to pop something up, something else for you that you probably have seen, which is this. Uh, that is in Oregon, um, and it's a pyrocumulus. Is that what they call it? A uh, pyrocumulonimbus. So Pyro, uh, okay. pyro, pyrocumulus would be um, a heat developing cumulus cloud, but a pyrocumulonimbus means that the nimbus part relates to uh, water being formed in it. So the word nimbus relates to precipitation falling. So a cumulonimbus means that um, this is tall enough to not only generate lightning, but also most likely produce some form of precipitation if there was enough water vapor. And what we're getting now is we're getting a lot of moisture coming in from the southwest United States, wrapping around this big ridge that's now sitting over um, Colorado and Utah. So what's happening is the upper level high has kind of shifted north a little bit. So the heat dome has pushed up into Idaho, Montana, and North Dakota. And as it's pushed north, it's allowed moisture to come in from the south. So you're literally getting moisture into um, Texas, New Mexico, into um, Arizona, and then funneling up into the Sierra Nevada mountains and eventually the Cascades of Oregon. Now what ends up happening is instead of just being dry, now you're getting these afternoon cumulonimbus and pyro cumulonimbus clouds which generate lightning, and lightning as we all know um, produces wildfires and you end up getting this. So mm -hmm. this is the part of the, or this is the second part of the, if you want to call it, the maturation of a wildfire season is you start out dry, you end up getting really, really warm, and then if you start to get moisture, you end up getting thunderstorms, and then the thunderstorms produce lightning, and then lightning produces basically um, your wildfires. And it's still sad to me that I look up in the sky, and today is not as bad as the last two days, but our sky has not been a deep blue um, in over two weeks. And all the haze up there is still smoke from the wildfires, yeah, that you see there uh, developing across the western United States. And I got, guys, I don't remember the last time we've had three consecutive summers of looking up and every day we're seeing smoke in the sky from yeah. wildfires. I, I don't ever remember seeing that. Um, I, well, there's can more I ask than you, 70 wildfires out there right now, according to the Guardian. Is that right, 70? Okay. Yeah. I, and and I, just to clarify something, just so I know, and uh, and and maybe other people too, are the are these clouds just moisture? What does the 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 smoke from the fire have to do with creating these clouds? Well, Any the smoke. From yeah, so the smoke from the wildfire has particulate matters in it, um, and those particular matters, if you want to call it that, matter being something that you can put your finger on and touch, actually allows water vapor to coalesce. So you can actually get water vapor move up into the atmosphere in a tropical environment, and if the water vapor doesn't coalesce on anything, you don't get droplets. So you'll literally get a, a almost a clear atmosphere of water vapor that'll go up and then eventually come down. And what happens sometimes is you have super cooled liquid water droplets where the atmosphere is so warm in the upper levels that it doesn't create crystals of ice where the water droplets can then form onto. But if you have any sort of particular matter that the water vapor can hold onto, they'll grow. And as they grow, they form droplets. And that's what eventually helps produce the thunderstorm part of the pyrocumulonimbus cloud. Once that happens, once you develop a thermal that has water vapor in it, that you can actually see water vapor is warmer than the surrounding environment. So if you if you fly an airplane through a cloud and you hold the thermometer outside, the outside uh, outside air of a thunderstorm at thirty thousand feet will be about ten degrees warmer than the environment that's not in the thunderstorm. So what happens is you literally get a cloud that's warmer, and if it keeps getting warmer and warmer in a cooler environment, it continues to go up. And as it goes up, the charge or the particles become separated. So you'll have uh, uh, positive charges here, negative charges down here. And as those become separated and separated, what do opposites do? They attract and boom, you get a lightning bolt. So 
the water vapor that that holds on to smoke particles creates a cloud. That cloud goes higher up into the atmosphere. The higher it goes, the more lightning you have, and then the better mm-hmm. chance you have of getting wildfires. Does that, that all was- make sense? Yeah, that was a brilliant explanation. That that clarifies a lot of things. So basically, it's the uh, the fire is giving, uh, it's feeding particles into the atmosphere that allows the moisture to uh, aggregate. So higher up and become yeah, exactly, exactly to become aggregates, and then once that gets higher up, you get lightning. So the one thing you want is as dry of an atmosphere as you can possibly have within a heat wave and a drought. Once you get that rim of moisture come around the backside, it just feeds upon itself. Wow. All right. One of the other things that I noticed, and I'm going to pop up the uh, drought monitor map here, um, is I was looking at my radar yesterday, and I noticed that uh, there were some, it looked like moisture on the radar in the west, in Arizona and some in Utah, um, it didn't get as far west as California. Um, is there a monsoonal flow going on? A friend of mine said there might be some moisture coming into Arizona right now. What's the <laughs> story with that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the monsoonal flow right now is alive and well. The dew point this morning in Albuquerque was 61. The dew point wow. in Tucson, yeah, the dew point in Tucson, Arizona on Wednesday was 64. And the dew point in Phoenix was 61. Now, that's usually fairly low to the ground. That'll mix out pretty quickly. But you can see that the eastern part of Colorado is fine. They've been wet. Uh, The eastern part of New Mexico is beginning to kind of, you know, eat away a little bit. But because the, the flow of air comes in from the south and east, as it does so when it goes over the southern areas of the Sierra Nevada mountains, it dries out. So you'll get thunderstorms in like maybe the Vegas mountains up to about maybe Yosemite, and then that's about it. It'll stop because it'll down so. So most of the thunderstorms in the monsoonal flow will get caught up in what's called the Mongolian Rim. That's the northeast part of Arizona. And if anybody has ever been to the northern part of Arizona, especially the northeast, to me mm-hmm. it's, it's a complete separate state than the south and southwest. Oh, yeah. You have the lar- yeah. You have the largest ponderosa tree forest in the world. And I think yeah. it's called the White Mountains in that part of Arizona. It's beautiful. Um, and ponderosa pine actually hold on to quite a bit of moisture. But what they're doing studies on now, um, I was just looking at something from, it may have been Arizona State or University of Arizona. What they're noticing is that the, the drought is not allowing the moisture to get into the top four inches of soil and get down into um, the root system of the ponderosa pine. Because what they're now concerned about is you look at a a forest and you go, wow, look how green it is. But you're not realizing that it's it's pulling out moisture that's probably either there from last year or the year before. Um, And what you really got to do is kind of get into you know, the area around the tree and try to figure out, is there enough moisture that the tree can grab on its own without us helping it out? And clearly you're not going to go around and start watering trees, but there's got to be a better way of us managing forests because look what happened to uh, the forests in parts of Colorado when the, um, uh, the pine bark beetle got into it. It literally devastated that area about around Grand Lake up into Montana. Mm-hmm. And those forests are gone. They're, they're dead. They're dead. And all they and worry Grand about Lake every year is... Fires. Yeah, and, and you're right, Pig. And, and all they're worried about is, like, when is that area going to go next? So, yeah, I mean... Um, and in speaking of that drought map, I sent you guys something just about 15 minutes ago. I'm sorry for the late arrival on that. But even the hydrologist from the National Weather Service says here that the impact of the drought in parts of McHenry and Lake County doesn't seem to be as severe due to the fact that they've had some decent rains. I just drove through that area yesterday. The corn looks fantastic. It really does. So they're kind of concerned that that extreme drought that you're seeing there is, again, and I've been saying this for two weeks now, not that I'm smarter than anybody else, but just driving through it, it doesn't seem to be that bad. 
and even the Fox River, which starts out just south of um, Lake Winnebago. Um, I looked at the Fox River that goes over Route 50 in Walworth County, mm -hmm. and it's up almost three feet because they've had nearly four and a half to five inches of rain in the last week in East Central Wisconsin. So if you look at a map that I sent you, it shows the seven day rainfall and it's unbelievable. The seven day rainfall literally has a minimum right over the areas where we need the rain. <laughs> it's like there's this dome over Northern, Northern Lake and McHenry County that says, okay, whatever you guys bring yeah. it, we're, we're putting it over there, over there, over there, over there. I know, Peg, you and I were texting. I got nine tenths of an inch of rain the other night. There was about an inch and a half to two inches with that little teeny cell that came across Kane yeah. and DuPage um, and Cook County. Here. And yeah, you, you get north of Half Day Road, and there was nothing, literally nothing at that point. Wow. So um, it's going to be that way for the next seven days. We get very dry, very dry. So those that map probably is not going to change a lot right now. Nope. That Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's do yeah. a forecast because we're running a little bit behind here. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you notice we had literally lake effect clouds almost all day yesterday. They, they cleared out late last night. Um, I think we had, I think yesterday and the day before was the, I'm trying to think, 13, 14, 15th day, no, 14th day out of 18 that's been below normal for the month of July, which is really rare. So we're running 3.2 degrees below normal for the month. We've only had two days so far where it's been above 90, as opposed to the month of June, where we had, I think, 10 days above 90, I think 10 or 11. But we're up to 14 for the season. Um, and I don't think we're going to get a nine, another 90 degree day around here for at least the next seven days. So we're back in the same pattern again with this big upper high across the northern plains, northerly flow not northwesterly flow, but northerly flow, which means you're not going to get any sort of thunderstorms that develop over Iowa and move into our area. So um, upper 70s lakefront today, which is kind of nice for July, uh, lower 80s inland, mid 80s tomorrow, mid 80s Tuesday, mid 80s Wednesday, mid 80s Thursday, maybe a weak front with a little bit of rain coming at us on Thursday. But um, other than that, I don't see anything in the way of any high heat or high humidity anytime soon. Lake water temperature, I think, is barely at about 68. But let me tell you, I was up in Madison, Wisconsin yesterday, and Lake Mendota was green, mossy, and it stunk. Ooh. So I'll take, uh, I'll take a 68-degree lake water temperature with clear water as opposed to 75-degree lake water. When you put your foot in, you can't see your toes a foot down. It was, it was pretty mucky up there, and you could smell it too. So, again, a lot of that is the problem of the runoff from, from area farms as well. They've been dealing with that for years. that's a fairly shallow lake, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, it is. And all the lakes in that area, Peg, are always fighting with, you know, how much um, nutrients are, are dripping back mm -hmm. into the soil. And I, I remember when I was up there in college, you couldn't even swim in the lake once you got around August. It was green. It was really disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like how... Kind of like how Lake um, Lake Erie, Erie is in the western part yeah. of the yeah, their, their their algae blooms are terrible every year. So when people complain that our lake is cold, give me a break. <laughs> it's not that bad. Okay, that right. bad. all right. Go go back to the British Open, or actually, as they call it, the Open. Uh, the Open. The, yeah. The by open. the way, real quickly, Mike, um, Louis Oosterin, who was ahead by two is now back by two. He put it in the bunker and went from bunker to bunker. Oh, no. <laughs> so so I, even you and I uh, who have gone bunker what? to bunker, the <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, her what a bunker is. It's sand. <laughs> he put it in the sand. And, and in, and, and in why the, did you say he put it in the sand? Because it's a bunker. That's what it is. All right, Rick, it's not going to work. All right, Rick, we'll... It's a, uh, we'll, it's a, it's a big bunker. <laughs> yes. All right. Rick, uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, and, uh, okay, let's, uh, let's get out of here. I want to thank all of the uh, folks uh, who are on the show today. Of course, um, MWRD commissioner, Deborah Shore and, uh, Justin, Justin Hart. Hart. What a great conversation. Um, meteorologist, Rick DeMaio, um, Kathleen 
Thompson upstairs giving us uh, advice on how to get the word about Sega. Go enter the contest. Uh, Basil the dog, Legata the cat, and especially all of our listeners. Um, boy, uh, stick with us if you can and tell your friends to. And don't forget, sign up on YouTube. So until next time, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Yeah, uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. Ha <laughs> ha